Welcome to Art Toronto. My name is Mia Nielsen. I'm the director of the show, and I'd like to welcome you to our platform talk, Claiming Space, Women in the Art World. This is presented by the Contemporary Art Galleries Association, and uh, I'm thrilled to welcome Fanny Gravel Patry. She's a PhD candidate at Concordia. Divyani Saltzman, Director of Public Programming at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Vivian Mayer, founder and owner of Vivian Art in Calgary, as well as artist Winnie Trong. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to uh, this uh, panel organized, uh, this roundtable uh, discussion organized by Art Toronto in collaboration with um, AGAC, which is the Contemporary Art Gallery Association, um, on the topic of women in the art world. Um, so we have three panelists today. Uh, thank you so much for being here and being part of this discussion. I'm really excited uh, to see um, what we will uh, talk about and hopefully we can imagine some, um, we can speculate about the future of women in the art world throughout this discussion. Um, so we have Vivian Mayer, who is the founder and owner of Vivian Art, which is a contemporary commercial art gallery in Calgary with a mission to support emerging and mid-career Canadian artists. She completed her Bachelor of Arts of Fine Arts at the Alberta University of the Arts in 2010 and opened her gallery in 2013. Um, she considers relationship building at the very core of her success. This paired with her commitment in her commitment to invest in what she believes in has kept her afloat in a very challenging market. Um, so hopefully we can talk about this um, today. We also have Diviani Saltzman, who is the Director of Public Programming at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, Diviani Saltzman is a Canadian writer, curator, and arts leader with a deep practice in relevant multidisciplinary programming at the intersection between art, ideas, and social change. She's the Director of Public Programming at the AGO, working across all disciplines where she was brought into the museum context to increase engagement and continue to reshape the idea of the museum as a, form for, as a forum for discourse reflecting community and the narratives of Torontonians. <laughs> I don't know if I pronounced this right, <laughs> um, but thank you for being here. Um, and it's really interesting to see that we have uh, women from different backgrounds in the arts. And then finally, we have Winnie Truong, who is an artist, um, is a Toronto artist working with drawing, cut paper and animation to explore ideas of identity, feminism and fantasy and finding its connections and transgressions in the natural world. She has exhibited her work internationally and was a 2017 recipient of, a, of the Chalmers Arts Fellowship. Um, so welcome you all uh, to this uh, round table. Uh, so what I suggest uh, doing is, um, I just wanted to just give a little context of where like from, from the, the position from which we're talking today, because obviously we're doing this online for a reason, because there's a pandemic, we cannot really, um, we can't really ignore that uh, situation right now. Um, and I think the art world, uh, like most aspects of our lives uh, since the beginning of the pandemic um, is in a crisis. Um, so from COVID-19 related closures, uh, we have seen a lot of transformations um, in our work environments um, and we have all, also seen um, a, a kind of like resurgence of a Me Too movement online. Um, I don't know if it was uh, the case in, uh, in your cities or provinces, but here in Quebec we've seen a lot of uh, denunciation of psychological and sexual harassments um, in workplaces and mostly in the art world as well. Um, and then there was obviously the Black Lives Matter protest and ongoing indigenous rights movements in Canada and abroad. Um, 
And um, I think with everything that's going on right now, the art world is being shaken to the core and forced to question its most uh, fundamental beliefs, like a lot of institutions um, here in Canada and across the world. So hopefully we can talk a little bit more about this. Um, and I think most importantly for a roundtable today, um, these crises have laid bare some of the art world's deepest structural inequalities and showed that women in the art world, even though we are more present, uh, continue to experience stigmatization and uh, oppression in differentiated ways. So one of my, so the first kind of thing I wanted to explore today is um, most specifically the workplace. Um, and first of all, how did the pandemic um, uh, affect your, uh, your place in the art world? And um, did you expect, did you experience any changes with the fact of like being, uh, having to work from home um, and not being able to, uh, to work in your specific spaces, like the gallery, the museum? the studio, um, are you able to go back now? So how has this affected you? And like, did you see more, more generally a change in how, in the place of women in the art world? Who would like to start? <laughs> um, I'm, happy, I'm happy to speak. Yes. I, don't, I don't wanna go too long though, because I think we all have very different uh, things to add. Um, it, it, it meant being at home uh, mm -hmm. until middle of June when I was able to open again. Um, and um, I pivoted pretty quickly uh, to put energy into social media and uh, partly for my own sanity because I don't sit well. So I, um, as soon as I was back from New York, actually I was in New York for the Armory Week. Uh, so when I came back, I went into isolation on my own into quarantine because I was, you know, the very next week, New York declared a state of emergency. Uh, so um, I did that. And then while I was quarantined, everything shut down. So I began um, a couple of Instagram series on the Vivian Art Gallery account. Um, the first one was called Staring at My Four Walls. Uh, and then, um, and I basically went through my collection, which, uh, I didn't do every piece, but I think what made that series special was that so many of the artists um, were willing to participate. So I got one minute videos or two minute videos from the actual artists speaking about the work in my collection. And I included that in the post. And I think that's why it was so well received mm -hmm. and um, doubled the gallery's uh, Instagram followers from March to June. And um, while uh, I would have been skeptical about that being a benefit before. Uh, in uh, light of current changes, online presences have become far more important in the commercial art world, and I would say art world generally. And uh, so reopening middle of June, I actually moved to locations which had been pre-planned, and I'm now across the street from Esker Foundation in Englewood in Calgary. Um, I now do, I've been doing a video for every single exhibition. I have an online store, which I did not do before, that I've slowly been adding inventory to as I do shows. And um, I also have had virtual tour on the website for each of my exhibitions. So I've just added um, some elements that weren't there before to make things accessible, which I actually think um, is a nice benefit of all of this crisis. I mean, if you, in social work theory, which was my last career, um, danger plus <clears throat> danger and opportunity equals crisis. So um, there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that uh, barriers are being removed to access. And that's a really wonderful benefit. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll piggyback off of Vivian. Um, so I'm one of Vivian's artists. And for me, at the beginning of the pandemic, while a lot of artists, I mean, definitely a lot of shows and opportunities were canceled, it's also that a period of isolation that could be great for research or for a lot of self-reflection. But for my reality, I'm the mother of a two-year-old. So there's that whole childcare issue. And even in a really 
sort of equal division of labor sort of household that I think I am lucky to be a partner within, um, even in those greatest circumstances, the inequality of that division of labor with women and with me being the woman artist, it's, it really became a time just for caregiving for me until things started opening it, opening it up, up. So not until we we're able to bring in um, my family into the fold, um, have I actually been able to sort of get back into things in the studio. And I mean, as far as a lot of cancellations of in-person um, opportunities and art fairs that are generally a lot of how we sort of survive and how we are able to participate and engage and show sort of new work and new research that we've been doing in the studio. Um, I've been lucky enough that, you know, people I work with like Vivian have been able to bring these platforms online and um, a lot of artists and artist collectives um, have invited me to be a part of sort of these online engagements. So Banded Purple is a Toronto based sort of programming um, venture that did a bunch of online gallery shows. And now I'm working on a public art commission with the Bentway Conservancy and the city of Toronto to do a big public projection of animation. So my stop motion animation to really respond on the idea of what is essential to this time during the pandemic and what have we lost and what has this sort of moment of crisis made um, very clear. Um, so like different opportunities have arisen that um, are definitely a response to that. So it, I think it's generally been a big time of adaptation for me. So I've been privileged in that way that it hasn't been merely survival. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think just building on the same themes in loss, there is also opportunity. We shut down in, in mid-March and uh, uh, running the programming team involves working with the, cur the curators who do live performance in the gallery, our artists in residence program, which Ness Lee was in just before we shut down and uh, all of our talks and the spaces we use are Walker Court and Bailey, Bailey uh, which is you know 400 seaters or 500 people in the center of the museum. And all of a sudden the programming team became the kind of leads on digital content. And what, what happened is, is our reach increased hugely and uh, it, it was a, a very steep learning curve, but an amazing one. So a conversation we have coming up with Claudia Rankin all of a sudden is reaching 6,000 people within a week in terms of views as opposed to 400 people. And all of our content is free and our performance programming went into AGO Homestage a Friday evening channel where we had the opportunity of catching up with Zadie Shaw in her studio and, and different people we had worked with, Brendan Fernandez coming up. Um, so, so it's actually been a, a really great challenge, but also an incredible increase in audience and reach and artists we can talk to around the world. So um, obviously challenging in terms of a team working together, not seeing each other for seven months, but a, a, an ability to really grow who we speak to. So fortunate for that. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. I think you all touch upon the idea that there are um, opportunities that come out of these crises and these moments, these unexpected moments um, and uh, events that happen in our lives and in the world. Um, and I think one of the, the core elements that kind of came out of the, the whole COVID-19 situation is uh, the idea of, of care and um, being more... Um, in tune with the people we work with um, and I was wondering in terms of um, in terms of labor and um, responsibilities if uh, if you felt like as a woman you were maybe um, expected to take on more um, while still being at home like Winnie you're you said you're a mom um, like how did that uh, go for you and did you feel any pressure of having to take on more responsibilities um, than your co-workers, for example? I mean, it, it's just relative to my situation. I mean, it is, there are working moms all over the place that have to do what we do now through this mm -hmm. sort of interface and while minding our small children. So it's like a challenge across the board. And I think for me, not being able to get in the studio was, you know, a small sacrifice in 
the big scheme of things. But yeah, we, I, I mean, obviously, I do feel the pangs of missing out on work. So I don't know if there is like a right or, you know, other course while there were restrictions and while the restrictions continue to be in place, it's just mm -hmm. what needs to be done. And I think within my situation, like my partner, while he does work in the arts, he has very set schedules, whereas naturally due to the flexibility, it, it does sort of fall on me and not in an unjust way. It's just the way it needs to be. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I have three sons, but only two of them are at home and I'm in a very different circumstance. They're 16 and 18. So um, they were at home as well, of course, finishing their schooling um, at, in the house. Uh, I became a bit of a domestic goddess, I'm not going to lie. I think a lot of us um, turn to nurturing as a way to uh, naturally fill time and feel productive. Um, and so I did that. I only have, um, at that time, I just had one full-time staff member and I kept her on full-time. I'm quite grateful for some of the funding that, that's available for small businesses like mine so that I was able to not lay her off. Um, so she worked from home. And to be quite honest, there was work for her to do. Like I, mm -hmm. I really needed her um, and, uh, and was thankful that I was able to keep her employment steady. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm self-employed, so it's just, uh, and that's it. That's the team. <laughs> that's us. Um, so, uh, it, it, the, my son's, um, father doesn't live with us, but he certainly did step up as well and was a much more consistent presence in our household, um, through the, uh, period of, of shutdown. Um, and, um, like Winnie, I feel quite fortunate that I'm, um, in a relationship, even if it's just a parenting relationship in my case, where, um, where my partner takes on a lot of responsibility in that. Um, so I feel for people who don't have that, I feel for people that don't have the benefit of that. Um, I, I don't have children, but I, I don't have the benefit of that. I'm a single woman in my 40s living alone, mm -hmm. working what feels like a, a, a big gig right now from home without that kind of tag teaming around food preparation or cleaning or care and company at the end of the day. So I've, um, you know, I, have, I feel fortunate that my friend network is what has stepped in and my neighbors in terms of just social kind of commu community. Um, but I do, I do realize even something as simple as kind of co-preparation of food or shopping or emotional support when someone, I, I'm in a pretty much a 60 to 70 hour a day Zoom, seven hours a day Zoom type role um, is definitely lacking. So it's interesting. It's just, you find that in different ways. And for me, it's, it's friends and community, but uh, not necessarily partnership. Mm -hmm. Definitely different kinds of, um, of uh, kinship that come out of these situations as well. Um, we still have uh, 10 minutes, so I wanted to jump into the second question that I had for you today, um, which was more related to um, diversity and inclusion of um, women of color and indigenous women in the art world. Um, so we've seen recently with um, the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States and the death of Breonna Taylor, but also in Quebec recently, um, the death of Joyce Echaquan in the Juliet Hospital that was broadcasted through uh, Facebook that a lot of these um, unfortunate uh, situations and um, so that we've been uh, basically witnessing uh, systemic oppression um, of Black and Indigenous women, mainly through visual media, um, which has pro proven to be uh, both necessary and traumatic at the same time, especially for these communities that are affected. And I wanted to um, have your opinion on what does that say about the art world and the need to include uh, women artists and curate curators from different backgrounds. Um, and then what we can do uh, to make our spaces and institutions more, um, more inclusive. 
I jump in if that's okay? Yeah, of course. No, I mean, I think we're in a huge moment of reckoning mm -hmm. around structural, structural racism, especially within institutions, but in the arts and culture more broadly, I come in kind of from a position of a mixed race woman, she, her, growing up mm -hmm. in Toronto, um, half Punjabi, half white. And um, I've had the opportunity of working in some major institutions, often as the first woman of color in that role at the Banff Center and now at the AGO. And um, I, I think this is a, a breaking point where I had the op opportunity of writing an essay of some thoughts on culture about the disconnect between what looks like progressive programming and the internal structures mm -hmm. and lived reality mm -hmm. of BIPOC folks within those spaces. And I think that's what we need to really bridge right now. I know in the AGO, we're in a deep dive internally that many people don't see around our own training and conversations between we can, there's, there's three women in artistic roles of color right now. There's Wanda Nanabush, there's Julie Crooks, there's myself, there's Audrey Hudson, our new chair of public programming and education, but we're a 500 person institution. So mm -hmm. the gap between putting on Nicolene's Femme Noir or us doing progressive programming and conversations with Claudia Rankin versus the lived reality of our BIPOC staff is, is great. And I think we have to focus on, on, on how we how we close that gap before we continue to tell a narrative of progressive progressive content that's not reflected by the lived, lived experience. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. That's what I'm thinking totally. about a lot right now. I'm also in terms of feminism, thinking about intersectionality and feminism. So we're, you know, I grew up with, with first and second wave feminist parents or aunts, but um, I've also seen a lot of lateral violence between women and between mm -hmm. women of color and, and white women in power as well. And I think we have to broaden the definition around uh, feminism to encompass intersectionality and recognize power imbalances there as well. Thank you. I mean, again, I, I don't think Debbie could have said it even better than that. Um, but for me, again, par gender parity is one issue and making that a, a very uh, intersectional conversation and who gets a seat at the table is a completely different thing. And it's more nuanced than just sort of men and women on gallery rosters it goes <laughs> so far beyond that and obviously um black and indigenous women need a seat at the table and they need to be a part of these sort of conversations where we're talking about um anti-racism anti-oppression work um they need to be le leading these things and being compensated for sort of doing the work as well mm -hmm. so it's like I, I'm not a leader in that way, but I'm here to listen and I'm learning. So, yeah. Um, without taking too much airtime, uh, I just wanted to say, I, from a commercial gallery context, mm -hmm. which is um, sometimes seen as an entry point, um, and and I think traditionally a lot of public institutions have looked or found talent and supported artists through that come through a commercial gallery network. Um, I hope that's changing. I think it's changed a lot. Um, but as a commercial gallery, I'm in the fortunate position of being quite young. I'm seven years old as a, as a commercial space. Um, I think that as a result and because of who I am or how I think, um, I do have a 50-50 gender split on my roster. And that's something that I've been very deliberate about. Um, and, um, and I'm very aware as well of diversity around sexuality and race, um, but also that, um, that trust is the core of whether people even want to work with me. And that those are uh, relationships that I'll build over time and that I think are important. Um, but I think that one of the challenges for commercial arts dealers is to not only build those relationships, but potentially shift how we work. Um, because traditionally the control lays with the dealer, a lot of the control and decision-making and um, some dealers more than other, maybe there can be a real power dy dynamic there as well that I don't think sits very well um, in, this, in this climate. Um, so I think that there's also a challenge to uh, adjust how we approach artists, how we receive them, how we work with them, and how we, uh, what our relationships look like and how open those might be in terms of working in other gallery spaces as well as ours, or um, you know, 
the, the way of the contract wouldn't sit very well with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just think it's, uh, again, it's an opportunity to revisit how we work and adjust it. And maybe it's a little easier for me because I don't have a 30 year roster of artists that I've been building for 30 years and a bunch of corporate collectors. I've just never had that. So um, I've really uh, been able to um, build my gallery around a vision that's quite personal. Uh, and uh, I think that a lot of other um, art dealers find themselves in a much harder place to wiggle out of right now. Mm -hmm. There's definitely that pressure of having to keep up with the people that you've been working for a long time and and also for an institution like um, the AGO, it's also um, working with um, art historical canons. So how do you break from that uh, linearity? Yeah. Um, and maybe just for to close this um, this uh, panel discussion that went by very quickly. Um, just in light of uh, what we just discussed, um, maybe in just one or two sentences, what for you would be the main work that remains to be done uh, in, or in order to gain more parity in the art world for women, women of color? Uh, I, I would really like to see uh, the Canada Council as well as private sources of funding, invest in training and support um, to uh, give um, more individuals, women, um, opportunity to develop the skill set to step into important roles mm -hmm. at the top of institutions. Nice. Any, do you want to go or? or? Um, I mean, I'm just trying to think, um, I think for me, the work begins even earlier on and extending to really young women and giving them those, those opportunities of exposure to the arts or whatever it is. Um, that's sort of, I don't know if the right word is normalcy, but just to make it this sort of everyday adventure to see art and with the AGO being sort of um, free to anyone under 25. That's part of the beginnings of that kind of work. And um, the, the other thing is like, I think a lot of these positions of power or sort of roles and jobs within the arts, like maybe part of the conversation is looking at different pedigrees of education. Like not everyone has a formal education and that's part of this discussion of access and parity and sort of bringing a more equitable circumstances to everybody because there are sort of other ways in to that aren't necessarily traditional academia so a, a lot of artists activists and more grassroots organizations could be starting points to look for people to occupy these positions of influence and power so i think <laughs> that's that for me is the starting point thank you I think it's it's all I think it's all of those things, and I also think kind of a, I think there you know Vivian touched on it in terms of the top. I think the culture has to run from from the bottom and from artists you're working with and collectives all the way to governance structures. And I think we have to look at shifts in terms of governance as well. And I, I see that happening within our own organization and many institutions. But it really it really does have to also look at we have to look at cluster recruitment. We have to look at leadership positions where BIPOC folk, they, you know, there, there is a lot of goodwill bringing in people in, in the middle, but that isn't necessarily translating to a shift in terms of legacy at the top. So I think that has to go hand in hand with, with fostering the next generation of, of artists and potential leaders. The long game, I just feel like it's, yeah. it's longer. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Another question um, that I had was really more related to the Me Too movement and uh, it's kind of a, it's resurgence uh, over the summer. I don't know if um, maybe you can talk from your own perspective, if you've seen some uh, denunciations of um, different forms of harassment, because um, in Quebec, there was a lot of denunciation of sexual harassment um, of male artists uh, towards 
other female artists or um, art workers and, all, and cultural workers and also um, denunciation of uh, harassment within the workplace um, within art galleries and museums um, and so I just wanted to hear um, what were your thoughts about um, this new movement and what does it say uh, about the art world and parody in the art world uh, right now? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure that I'm seeing um, seeing the resurgence as much uh, mm -hmm. in Alberta. Um, um, I mean, although I'm saying that on social media, it's it's goes across the country, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. it's not really regional. Um, I, I've certainly seen much more um, unrest um, and concern around the BIPOC issues and. Um, and sometimes that certainly will also tie in to sexual um, uh, abuse or harassment. Uh, I, I've certainly been pleased that one of the sad benefits of all of this has been uh, way more attention and interest in the loss, um, disappearance and violence towards Indigenous women. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm seeing a lot around that, and um, and I celebrate that that it's about time. So it's one of those things that when um, sad and horrible things happen in our world, sometimes it becomes an opportunity to really uh, put energy and attention in important places, and that's one of them. Thank you. And I think for me, I've I've kind of been following along with that specific incident in Quebec. I think I have an idea of what and who that incident refers to. But I think for me, I've just been lucky enough to work specifically with um, so many female galleries in the past, um, women who have run, run very sort of women heavy rosters. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, the power dynamic doesn't sort of venture into that sort of predatory conversation and I've been lucky to have been spared from some of that so I mean that said with all of this coming back up it's it's great that women can come forward and speak up about these things in the workplace and just in I guess life in general that the survivors get to speak out and and in turn, more women will come forward and perhaps we can invert this patriarchal system we mm -hmm. all occupy. Thank you. I think like, I mean, I'm, I think when he is in Toronto, I'm, I'm in Toronto, I, I've, I've been, I've been kind of seeing more around about power and equity around, around BIPOC artists and arts mm -hmm. workers and less so around what you were seeing in Quebec over the summer with Me Too, but mm -hmm. obviously, um, glad to see those voices come up. Um, I, I also think just more generally, there's a trend which is positive when done well around just not, not being willing to take harassment in any form for anyone regardless mm -hmm. of gender and identity. And mm -hmm. um, when that's done with a kind of a constructive lens in mind around uh, creating safe spaces and safe workspaces and equity, I think that's hugely important uh, regardless of gender. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would add that um, we're not really in a post Me Too moment. We're we're in a continu continuation, and Me Too kind of opened that door to speak about um, harassment in all of its forms, right? So not just um, sexual harassment, which is very important to tackle, obviously, but also psychological, um, identity related. Um, because no one should uh, live through um, any form of harassment um, in the art world or <laughs> any other uh, institution or um, space. So thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the three of you for participating in this uh, panel and bringing your thoughts. It was really interesting. I think what comes out of all of this is that um, there are crises and things that, and that are happening right now that um, necessitate that we react now, but there's also a temporality to all of this. And 
um, it obviously takes time um, to break down barriers. Um, and we can see that even though we are visible now, um, it will take even more time for, for parity to be, um, to be of um, a thing of the present, especially because, especially if we see parity as something that can only happen if all women are um, visible and heard and uh, valued. So um, thank you so much. And um, I think this uh, closes our uh, round table. <laughs> Um, so thank you again so much, and uh, I hope I get to see you <laughs> again in the the future. Thank, thank you, Fanny. Thank, thank you. you.